us open our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 20, and then also Romans chapter 8. And we're going to continue tonight sharing on how to be led by the Holy Spirit. Now, I was able to start my morning with prayer. I always enjoy that a lot. And I was really got the chance to talk with God today, and then I had a chance this afternoon. And I really began to, to, to dial in on some things tonight. And I believe this is going to be a great blessing and a help to you. Now, we're actually into our third our third class. It'll be lesson number two in your book, you that are taking the class tonight. Uh, some of you are just attending church. Some are taking class. So we're on lesson number two, and we're going to be talking about we're going to talk about this aspect of discovering the real you. Okay. Now here's what I want you to understand as we get into this tonight. That what we're going to share tonight is real foundational. Okay. But the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me again when we were in prayer, and He said, "Teach them how to walk in the Spirit. Teach them how to walk in the Spirit." That's very important because you've got to learn that, okay? And you know, it's really in revelation knowledge, it's not so much what's taught, it's what's caught, okay? Because I've taught for a number of years, and then there's a few people that get a hold of it, okay? And that's really the truth. You know, some people's lives just go on and on. Even though they attend church, it just goes on and on, and they don't ever learn how to really walk in the Spirit. It's not so much what's taught, it's what's caught, okay? And if you can just focus in for a little bit of time that we have here tonight... You can catch some things that will change your life forever. Because the Bible says if you'll walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that's very important for you to understand that because many Christians live and die and never really learn how to successfully walk in the Spirit. But if you can learn how to walk in the Spirit, miracles will open up for you. All kinds of things can happen in your life. God can use you in a great and mighty way. And God will cause you to walk in health. He'll cause you to to be rich and prosper, you know, to have an abundant supply in your life. All comes by just simply learning how to walk in the Spirit. Sure is easy to say, isn't it? Sure is different to do, isn't it? But see, some people, we're just so caught up in this world we live in, and it's all a visual world. It's even worse now today with all the things that are around us. You know, there's so much noise, so much visual things going on, so many things drawing for our attention. It's a sad today that there's a lot of Christians who don't even have time to read their Bible. And then they wonder why they're not blessed. They wonder why things don't work out for them, you know. But, you know, you've got to learn how to focus in and learn how to give your attention to God. And if you do that, then he'll teach you by his spirit what it means to walk in that. So we've again laying a foundation, and we talked about that. Last week we talked about the person of the Holy Spirit. What did we say was the key to being led by the Spirit? Fellowship. 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 The key to being led by the Spirit is fellowship. Spend a lot of time with the Holy Spirit. Spend, he said, how do you spend time with the Holy Spirit? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. He's the author of the book. When you, every time I open the Bible, I say, Holy Spirit, would you show me something today? Help me to receive, you see? And then spend time in prayer. When you spend time in prayer, you spend time with the Holy Spirit. And we'll give you an opportunity tonight to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues. Because when you pray in the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 14 says this, He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men but unto God. And in the Spirit he speaks secret truth. You see, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, Paul said in verse 14, If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. My mind's unfruitful. My spirit prays. My spirit prays. Every time I speak with other tongues, my spirit speaks. Every time I pray in other tongues, my spirit prays. And every time I let my spirit pray, every time I let the inward man pray, the inward man becomes stronger. You understand that? Every time I let my inward man speak, my inward man becomes stronger. Every time my flesh speaks, my flesh becomes stronger. Every time I speak out of my mind, my mind becomes stronger. But if I can learn how to communicate out of my spirit, then I, the real man, become stronger And then I can begin to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. It's very simple. Real simple. We said at the beginning of this, remember, the things of God, they are not easy. Okay? They're not always easy. But praise God, they're attainable. First thing we talked about, Proverbs 20, 27. I challenge you to memorize this verse. The Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. The Spirit of a person is God's candle. And that is what God uses to enlighten your life. So if you don't understand that you're a spirit, well, then you're going to miss God because God deals with your spirit, the inward man. 
Then Romans the 8th chapter, verse number 14. Oh, here's a great one. Could everybody just sit up real straight, please? Sit up real straight, please. I said, please. Thank you so much. Now, Romans the 8th chapter, verse number 14 says this. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You see that now? For as many as what? For as many as are led. Okay, let's look at it real quick. Romans 8, and I'll, I'll get into the breaking these words down a little bit. There's, there's a great truth right here for you to understand. Romans, the 8th chapter. Now, again, I'm just encouraging you. You know, now it won't be a part of your grade or part of your test, but I would encourage you to memorize these verses. They'll change your life. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, notice that now, they are the sons of God. That's the true sons of God, okay? The true sons and daughters of God are people that are led by the Spirit. Not just people that go to church or people that are religious, but they're led by the Spirit. Now, here's the beautiful thing. It says, for as many. Hebrews 8, 6 says, for we have a new and better covenant established upon better promises. Under the old covenant, not all of them could be led by the Spirit of God. The priest did, the prophet, the king. They were anointed for a season. But under the new covenant, we have the Holy Spirit within And thank God through the new birth. Then if you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you have the Holy Spirit up on. We have a new and better covenant because every one of us has a blood-bought right to be led by the Spirit of God. But you have to exercise your faith in that. You have to believe God for that. You have to exercise your faith and declare that out of your mouth. Say, I am led by the Spirit. Say it with me right now, would you? Say it again. I am led by the Spirit. Say, I am a child of God. I am led by the Spirit. Learn in life that you will rise up to the level of your confession. You will rise up and walk in the light of the words that you speak. And so if you just keep it neutral and don't say nothing, then that's what you'll have is nothing. But if you begin to speak it, you'll rise up to it. See, you've got to learn to do that. Now, not everybody's interested in that. I understand that. But I was. When I got born again... That was the greatest passion of my life, the greatest desire of my life. I'd lived long enough to know there was nothing out there that had anything for me that was profitable. So I set out on a course and a passion to learn the things of God and to walk in the Spirit. So I began to declare that every day and began to sh- declare that out of my mouth. You know, when, and I always have fun. I always take time for racquetball, you know. Got to take time to ride motorcycles and have fun. But the rest of the time... I was fully immersed into one thing, and that is learning how to walk in the Spirit. So when people were playing ball and carrying on and doing things and playing Nintendo and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars at the the movie store and all that kind of stuff, I'm walking around talking to myself. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Hallelujah. Amazing things started happening. Dreams and revelations started breaking forth in my life. Powerful. All of a sudden... Miracles started happening. People began to get healed. and I'd lead people to Christ. And great things began to happen. You know, and man, it's exciting life. I mean, you know, I mean, goodness gracious, hanging out the mall is fun. But what does that compare to leading somebody to Jesus? What does that compare to laying hands on a sick person and seeing them healed? Hallelujah. That's what life's all about. Amen? And oh, I tell you, that's a great thing. So you see, we can say, I can be led by the Spirit of the Lord. I encourage you to get those three verses down. Now think about it. The Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. As many as are led by the Spirit, they're the sons of God. Then verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our Spirit that we are the children of God. See, everything's involved in the Spirit. Spirit touches Spirit. You understand that? Spirit touches Spirit. So if you don't have revelation of Spirit then you really don't have revelation of God. You've got to grasp that. And you don't grasp it with your head, you grasp it with your spirit. And that's why it needs to come alive inside of you. Do you believe that? It's vital for you to train yourself. Oh, how I wish I would have trained myself when I was younger. Now, I grew up in church. I just didn't know Jesus. But my mother was baptized in the Holy Spirit when when she was carrying me in her womb. And... And so I, was, I grew up at a Pentecostal home. I grew up around people speaking in tongues. I grew up around miracles. My mom was used many times in powerful ways to see things happen. 
And I remember when I was a senior in high school, I quit going to school as soon as I, I mean, church as soon as I could. And um, I wanted to work, you know, and I wanted to race cars and have fun and go all that stuff. But my mom asked me, go back to, go back to church, you know, on the uh, day they honored the seniors, you know. And I did it for my mama. So I went back. I was sitting on the back row of the church, sitting back there minding my own business, getting ready to graduate high school. And I heard a voice just as clear as, as I would. You could hear me speak right now. I heard a voice say, why don't you go to Bible school? And I just spoke right up. I said, what in the world would I want to do that for? I did. I didn't mean to. But I did that. I just said, what in the world would I want to do that for? People even turned around to look at me, you know, and wondered what in the world I was doing talking in church. And just like that, that voice left me. Just like that. Just like that. It's easy to grieve the Spirit of God. Then I was uh, worked at a gas station at 21st and Harvard. My children always ask me to drive by and show that to them. <laughs> and I worked there for a while. You know, it was a good job in high school. I could keep my car clean and waxed and lubed. You know, had a wash bay. And, man, I had the cleanest car in town. Oh, you'd like it, Dennis. 67 Fastback GT Mustang. Boy, I could keep that thing clean and sparkly. I could just change the oil whether I needed to or not. I mean, it was really a great job, but... That ended, you know, you need to make more money. So I was going for another job. I was driving down North Utica. I didn't even, never had heard of Kenneth Hagin. Now, my parents, my mother always listened to Christian radio. Always did. Always read Brother Hagin's books, had T.L. Osborne books all around the house. I went back and read them all after I got saved. But I was um, driving down North Utica. Never even heard of Brother Hagin. Didn't know who he was. I was driving down, going to Kansas City Market, 1147 North Utica. I didn't know that just the year before, Brother Hagin moved his headquarters from Dallas, Texas to Tulsa, Oklahoma by, by the word of the Lord. And he had his evangelistic association there. And I drove right past it and I heard a voice say, turn in there. They need somebody to handle shipping and receiving. And you know what I did? I just kept going straight. What would have happened? What would have happened if I just simply would have done it? But the Spirit of the Lord always comes back. He always comes back. And he did. He came back into my room in December 1975, and I finally said yes. But I think about all those years that I wasted. I could have learned at an early age how to walk in the Spirit. You've got to make decisions with your life. You've got to make decisions every day. Every day. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. So if you've got somebody praying for you, even if you're not saved tonight, we'll give you a chance to get saved. If you are saved, he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. You may grieve him and he'll let an anointing lift for a season, but he'll come back. But if you've got somebody praying for you, even if you're not saved, he is with you, working to get you to understand you need Jesus. And every day you make decisions. You make decisions to either walk in the Spirit or you make decisions to walk in the flesh. You do that every day. I walked right away from the revealed will of God. 17 years old, and went out, and I'm telling you, almost cost me my life. Almost cost me my life. Oh, but thank God he kept coming back. So you've got to be sensitive. You make decisions every day. Now, I want to share with you some basic things tonight because, and this is what the Spirit said to me during praise and worship. If you don't learn this tonight, you will never be successful in walking in the Spirit. If you don't learn this tonight, or begin to learn it, you understand what I'm saying. He gives you lots of chances. If you don't grasp this principle, if you don't grasp this, you'll never be successful in learning how to be led by the Spirit of the Lord. Because there's many things out there, and the Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Yet, how many people try to approach God from a mental realm? They try to reason things out, you know, and they try to find answers that way. And then we're in a physical world, so a lot of people go around being ruled by how they feel. I often tell people, it doesn't matter how you feel. Just wait a minute. It'll change. So you can't base your life on feelings. But see, that's what many people do. And But the body is not the candle of the Lord. The mind is not the candle of the Lord. The spirit is the candle of the Lord. And many times, people seek guidance from every other place, you know, where you get in trouble. People seek guidance in Ouija boards, astrologers, dumb friends. Amen. Here's a great thought. If you need direction, find somebody smarter than you and older than you. Great thought. Amen. I remember years ago when a good friend of mine, his brother, 
And his wife just up and left him. It was kind of a change of life thing. And she was listening to devils and demons. And just walked away from a 20-some year marriage and three children. It was really a sad deal. And I, finally, he asked me, could I try to help her? And I tried. You know, I just went down to see her. And I said, listen, I don't have any investment in this at all except I love you. You know, What in the world are you doing? Acting like an idiot. And she said, well, my manager said. And so I caught that. So I listened a while. The man had been divorced five times. Divorced five times. And he's given her counsel on marriage. Now, who's the fool in this situation? Amen? The Bible says, Blessed is the man or the woman, the teenager, that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law that they meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, brings forth his fruit in his season, his leaves shall not wither. Whatever that he does shall prosper. That's just the opening of the book of Psalms. If you just memorize Psalm 1, it'd change your life. The wisdom of God is there. Say the wisdom of God. But if you don't understand what I'm going to share with you tonight, then you cannot even get to first base on how to be led by the Spirit. And that's where I want to pick up at. And to get there, we're going to go all the way back to the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, chapter 1. The first thing I want to talk with you about is spirit, soul, and body. Say that with me, please. Say spirit, soul, and body. You are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. Now, a lot of times people make a lot of investment in their body. They like to wear cool clothes, like to get their hair done cool. You know, they like to do all kinds of things. That's good. That's, That's all right. You want to be cool? It's good to be cool. It's better to be cool than not to be cool. And then a lot of times people take care of their body, like to work out, and that's good. You need to take care of the temple, okay? But you need to understand you're not just a body. This body is going to pass away. It's going to go back to the dust. It's going to be changed. I preached my good friend Grady's funeral this week, and I read from the book of Corinthians. It says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It's impossible. This body is going to be changed, okay? You're either going to go by the way of the grave, or when Jesus comes back, It'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So take care of it, but don't let it rule you. And then a lot of times, some of you are very intelligent. How do you know that? Because I look at you. I just tell. You're extremely intelligent. Mind's a great thing. Don't waste it. Your mind's wonderful. It's a great gift from God. It's a wonderful computer, but it wasn't made to rule you. It wasn't made to rule you. It wasn't created for that. When you put it in that position, you're putting a piece of equipment into a job that it was not programmed to do. And it's going to default. It's going to lock up. It's going to make mistakes, you see. You are a spirit. You have a soul. And you live in a physical house. Say, I am a spirit. spirit. Do you understand that? You don't have a spirit. You are a spirit. You're a spirit creation. You have a soul. That's your mind. That's a part of you that reasons and thinks. And it's, it's connected to the Spirit. And the only thing that can even divide them is the Word of God and the Spirit of the Lord. But we only do that for simplicity. They're eternally yoked together. Okay? But that real person is a spirit, creation. That's who you are. You have a soul. That's your mind, your will, your emotions. That part of you that reasons and thinks. And then you live in an earth suit. Some of them are bigger than others. Some of them are different colors than others. But you're not a body. You live in a body. You are on the inside. That's who you are. You need to understand that. You say, well, how in the world did you ever figure that out? By reading the Bible. Genesis 1 and verse number 26. Say this with me. Say, I am created in the image of God. Genesis 1 verse number 26. I was reading this again. I saw, look how many times this word image is used. Genesis 1 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Notice again, so God created man in his image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Did you see that over and over again? Image, likeness, image, likeness. One guy said, you mean God's like me? No, you're like God. We're created in His image. Amen? We were created after His likeness. Well, if that's true, and how many of you believe it to be true, then we need to ask a real important question. What is God like? 
Who is God? What is God like? I'm created in the image of God. So I need to understand what God is, who God is, what's that all about? And I tell you what, we find a great answer right from the lips of the Master. How many of you think that Jesus ought to know what God's like? Do you think so? He's always been with him throughout eternity. He only came to the earth for a little while. He should know, don't you think? Well, let's go over to the Gospel of John, the first book of the New Testament. We find this revelation right here, John 4. This is the story when Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well. We've often studied from it. And notice the statement that he made right here at John 4 and verse number 24. John 4, 24. Notice these four words. She began to talk with him. Jesus talked with him. And Jesus said, there's a day coming when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. And the Father seeks such to worship him. Now look at verse 24. God is a spirit. Do you see that? God is a spirit. God is a spirit. Now, he did not just say God is spirit. Some abstract, some kind of thing, you know. Some, some abstract idea. No, God is a spirit. The Amplified Bible says God is a spirit being. Okay? You are created in the image of God. You were created in the image of God. God is a spirit. What does that make you? You are a spirit. That's what you are. You're created in the image of God. You are a spirit being. And most of the body of Christ do not even have revelation of that. Don't have a clue. Just go through life operating out of their head, going by how they feel, going by what seems right. Going by what feels right, doing what they feel like doing, doing what their mind comes up with. Here's a great one. People often say to me, well, I just always do the first thing that comes to mind. Let me prophesy about your future. you got to understand you're created in the image of God. God is a spirit that makes you a spirit. So you need to put some attention to your spiritual life. That's deep, isn't it? Amen. You are a tripart being. Notice now, let's go over to 1 Thessalonians 5. Notice as Paul writes, now we saw that from the book of Genesis, we saw it from the lips of the Lord Jesus. Now notice what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. It's a wonderful, wonderful chapter. He's wrapping up this book. He talks about doing several things. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, quench not the spirit. It goes on and on. And then it says this, and... Verse 23, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Do you have it? If you got it, say, I've got it. And may the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Now notice that it's not H-O-L-Y, it's holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. We could say it this way, may the God of peace sanctify you completely or totally. All right? Now, that word sanctify is the word for holiness, Okay? So we could say this, may the very God of peace separate you and and make you completely holy, holy, okay? Totally holy, completely holy, okay? And then he said this, and I pray that God, I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the entirety of your creation being right there. Notice that now. Your whole spirit, soul, and and body. Until you understand this, you don't have revelation of the completeness of your life. Okay? You are a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body. You say, what in the world has that got to do with anything? It's got something to do with everything. Everything. Because he showed us something, the order of things. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Your whole spirit, soul, and body. Now here's where we get into trouble. And we've got to journey back to Genesis 2 to see it. Okay? Now, what is the spirit of man? It's the candle of the Lord. Is that right? Remember Proverbs 20, 27? The spirit of man is what? The candle of the Lord. Now, we need to understand. How many of you understand God didn't create us to fail? We weren't created for sin. We were not created to fail. We were not created to disobey. We were created to obey. But everybody's got a choice. In school today, you chose to obey your teachers or disobey. Ladies, you chose to obey your husbands or disobey. 
All right. Gentlemen, you chose today to obey your wives or disobey. Help me, Jesus. I'm going to say a poem. I feel it coming. Now, as we come here, understand you've got a choice to make. And the very first people on the earth, Adam and Eve, had a choice to make. Something powerful happened. In Genesis, the second chapter, in verse number 16, God gave them some orders, some directions. And then it says here in verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, and the Lord God gave the man a suggestion. Is that what it says? No, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you shall, what? You may freely partake, you may freely eat. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, now notice this now, therefore you shall surely die. Now let me ask you this. When Adam ate that apple, did he fall over dead? He didn't quit breathing, did he? Did he fall over dead? No, no. Somebody said, well, he didn't die. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. I understand this, and it will help you understand the Bible. In the Bible, death always means separation. Separation. It never means cessation of life. It means separation. Now, it's interesting to note, when he said this, dying, thou shalt surely die. Do you see that now? Okay, let me read it again to you now. I'm quoting from the Hebrew now. He says, you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Do you see those four words? Thou shall surely is the same Hebrew word as die. Thou shall surely. If you go to a Hebrew Bible, thou shall surely is that same Hebrew word as die. And he said this, dying spiritually, you shall surely die physically. It took a while for him to die physically, but he did. But he first died spiritually. You see that also again in Isaiah 53, verse number 9. Concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, it said, He made his grave with the rich and with the wicked in his deaths. Concordant version brings it out clearly in the Hebrew. He died twice. He first of all died spiritually. What does that mean? He was separated from God. Spiritual death is a separation of your spirit from God. Physical death is the separation of your spirit from your body. Eternal death or the second death is for you to be eternally separated from your creator. You are a spirit. You will never cease to exist. People say, well, I received eternal life. That means I'll live forever. No, you'll always live. You'll live forever. Just when you choose eternal life, you just get to choose where you'll live forever. You understand that? The Bible says death and hell will give up its inhabitants and all shall be cast into the lake of fire. Those who do not believe in Jesus shall be eternally condemned and separated from God, but they will still exist. You are a spirit. You will always exist because you're made in the image of God. What happened to Adam and Eve? They died spiritually. What can we say? Their candle was put out. You see that? The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. What happened when they disobeyed? Their candle was put out. And they were separated from the life of God. And you can immediately see what began to happen. The very first offspring, one of them killed his brother. What's going on? A new nature. A new nature is operating in mankind. Not the nature of righteousness and life but the nature of sin and death. And it's just gotten worse and worse and will continue to get worse and worse until Jesus comes back. But now, turn with me over to Psalms because this does get better. How many of you like good news? Say, I died in Adam. See, that's what you've got to understand. Most people don't understand that. You died in Adam. Your spirit was put out. You died in Adam. Oh, but aren't you glad the Bible says, but in Christ shall all be made alive. Glory. It's good news. Amen. Now, this is written in a time when David was running from from Saul and God delivered him. That's the context of it. But many things in the Old Testament are prophetic. 
In Psalm, the 18th chapter, verse number 28, it says this, Psalm 18, verse 28, For you, O Lord, will light my candle, and the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Hallelujah. Glory. Oh, yeah. Now, David was talking about a time that he was going through right then when he was being persecuted by Saul and going through problems. But that's also a prophetic word. Because, you see, our candle was put out in the Garden of Eden. But, oh, there's a day coming that God said, I'm going to relight your candle. And isn't it interesting? When he lights our candle, and what is our candle? Our spirit. The next thing that happens is he begins to enlighten our darkness. Why? Because the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And go with me to John chapter 1. Are you excited tonight? Anybody excited about learning about God? Oh, now, I want to tell you, this just gets so good, you can't hardly stand it right here. Watch this. Now, follow me through with the Bible. Follow me through. Say, God has lit my candle. God has lit my candle. Think about this now. Hallelujah. If he hasn't lit your candle, then we'll give you a chance to let that happen tonight. Amen. Just a little while, we'll give you an opportunity for God to light your candle. What an opportunity. Now, when you get into the Bible, there's different words used for life. The word we're going to look at is the word zoe, Z-O-E in the Greek language. And it means life in the absolute sense. When you go back and study zoe, it means this, life that gives life. I like that. Life that gives life, reproduces after its own kind. John 1, verse number 4. In him, say in Jesus. In Jesus was what? Was life. In him was life. And the life was what? Was the light of men. In him was Zoe. And the Zoe was the light of men. Now watch this. And the light shined in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Shined in what darkness? The darkness of the heart of humanity. Because humanity was in spiritual darkness, spiritual blindness. But there came one born of a virgin. There came one born of God. And in him, in Jesus, was life. And that life was the light of men. And then when Jesus came... The life that was in him, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And from him, that light began to shine out. People said, there's something different about him. Man, he speaks like one that has authority. There's something different about him. In him was life, that life was the light of men. And the light shined into the darkness. Now, the King James says, and the darkness comprehended it not. Not a good translation. It's the Greek word katalambano. And remember, the word kata always means something that comes with force, subjugating power. And the word lambano was that Greek word to receive, remember? Reach out, pull it to yourself, take it home, make it yours. Here's one great translation. In him was life, the life was a light of men, the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness couldn't overmaster it. And the darkness couldn't stop it. And the darkness couldn't contain it. The darkness couldn't receive it. No, it began to shine. And everywhere it was received, it began to shine and light candles. And all of a sudden, man, people began to come back to the light of life. And lives began to change. And people began to understand they weren't created to live like pigs. They weren't created to grovel in sin. They weren't created to live that way. They were created to live righteous. Light began to shine. And thank God it shines brighter and brighter. Can you say amen? Amen. Look over at John 3. Remember this story? There was a man came to to Jesus by night, a real smart fellow. He was a religious leader, a teacher of the law. Good man, honest man. He loved God. Tried to do the best he can. He came to Jesus by night because that wasn't good for his reputation. And he said to Jesus, he said, I know you've come from God, for no man can do the miracles that you do, except God be with him. And Jesus said to him, Except you be born again, you cannot see. We've got that darkness thing going again, don't we? Except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That's the same word I do that we used, remember, in the book of Revelation Sunday morning? When Jesus said, I know your works, that's that word see. It means to see and know. 
Except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God and you cannot know the kingdom of God. That is why for a sinner, someone in the world, to try to understand the Bible is a futile endeavor. To try to understand God and approach God from a mental standpoint, it is impossible to happen. It cannot happen that way. You see, you cannot know nor see, nor experience the kingdom of God, except you become born again. Hallelujah. Now, death is separation. What is life? The joining. Amen? The culmination again of coming back. And that's exactly what I talked about. Except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, watch this. John 5, verse number 24. John 5 and verse number 24. Here the Lord was speaking. He said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he that hears my words and believes on him that sent me have everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed. From death to what? From death to life. How? How do we pass from death unto life? He that believes on me, he that hears my words and believes on the one that sent me has everlasting life. Glory to God. Look at verse 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of God and they that hear shall what? Shall live. Hallelujah. He's talking about spiritual life. Now, he's not talking about Lazarus. He's not talking about the widow of Nain whose son was raised from the dead. No, no, no. He's not talking about physical death, though this life is so powerful, it will invade that that area also. But he is talking about people like you and me that hear and believe. And when we do, thank God he lights our candle. Glory. Is that good? Now look at verse 26 because it gets better. Look at this, verse 26. For as the Father hath Zoe in himself, so has he given the Son to have Zoe in himself. And John 10.10 says, And I have come... That you might have zoe and that you might have it overflowing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Boy, I tell you, that is good news right there. Amen. Follow the pattern. For the father had zoe in himself and he gave Jesus to have zoe in himself. And Jesus came that you might have zoe and you might have it in abundance. So the very life of God is inside of you if you're born again. Your candle has been lit. Thank God. Now your spirit is in union with God. If death is separation, life is union. Union with God. Joined again to Him. That's good news. Amen? Now I want to back up. Or I'm going to go forward. I didn't go to John 10. I quoted it. Look at John 8. Here's a powerful verse. John 8 and verse number 12. John 8. This is right after Jesus dealt with the woman that had been caught in the act of adultery. And he had went through that whole deal, okay? John 8, verse 12. Now watch this. Then spoke Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. And he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The life of God lights your candle. And God again did enlighten your darkness. And now your spirit is made alive unto God. And once again, you can have fellowship with the Father. Once again, you can walk in the Spirit. How? Out of your belly. That's where it happens. It's right there on the inside. Say on the inside. See, you've got to listen to that, though. I got born again, and I came from a very rough background, did a lot of things wrong, a lot of, you know, addictions and things of that nature, and run hard, and I got born again. And, you know, God began to talk with me at a very young age spiritually. And so I began to, to follow him. And I knew I had enough sense to know I couldn't go running where I used to run. But I, uh, I'd go to church. And my buddies would call me and say, well, let's go party. I said, no, I'm going to go to church. What in the world do you want to go to church for? I said, I'm going to go to church. That's why, I, because I'm saved. That's why I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And they would start cursing. But I liked to play shuffleboard. We hung out at really bad, rough, tough places. One of them was called Pete's Bar at 49th at Edison. The average age was 97. But they had real nice, real long shuffleboard tables. Not the kind on the ground you push with a stick, but 
the, the metal disc and sawdust, and you'd, you'd go in there and you'd shoot shuffleboard. Man, I'll tell you something, old man could shoot some shuffleboard. We'd go in there and drink beer. We'd first of all get loaded, and then we'd go in there and drink beer and play shuffleboard, you know. Well, I love playing shuffleboard. Still do. Well, I got out of church. This is where I met Sharon. After I met Sharon, I'd just go with her. Forget them boys. <laughs> But I, but I didn't have nothing to do, you know, and I knew I'd need to stay busy or my life would be a mess. And, uh, but they called me and said, well, when you go get through going to church, it was right across the street from the church I went to was Pete's Bar. And, uh, <laughs> would you come over to the bar and we'll shoot some shuffleboard? And I said, well, sure, I'd love to shoot shuffleboard. What'd you say? Oh, well, I didn't say I was the brightest boy in the world. <laughs> but I like to play shuffleboard, so what's the big deal, you know? So I go over there to play shuffleboard. And so we're playing shuffleboard, and, and I've just been safe for a few weeks. And the guy said, well, you want a beer? I said, well, yeah, that, that sounds good. I'll have a beer. And my friend David was over there looking at me. And I reached up to answer the, answer the question. What do I, I said to myself, I, I'd like to have a beer. I was getting ready to answer. And the light of life come in me, just like that. And I knew I picked that beer up. I would never be able to witness to him ever ever and i said no thank you i don't need that anymore but i'll take a coke and i went on and he watched me he's born again now he's born again today see the light of life walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh people often say well does the bible teach against drinking no it teaches against drunkenness but i've got enough sense to know that I never knew the difference. I didn't drink a can of beer. I drank a case of beer. I didn't drink a bottle of wine or a glass of wine. A glass? Who uses glasses with wine? You say, well, that's your problem. You're right. It is my problem. It is my problem. But if you've ever been an addict, you can't play. You've been an addict, you can't play. And I'm going to tell you right now, you can't play. You think you can play, you can't play. Huh. You're going to, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you your witness. It's going to cost you being used of God. If I had not obeyed God then, I probably wouldn't be doing today what I'm doing. You got to follow your spirit. Say, I'm a spirit. Let's pick this up. Go with me to 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. How many of you like to know how to overcome lust? Anybody like to know how to overcome lust? Oh, that's a good way to overcome lust. I'll, I'll show you right here. Three dimensions. First of all, you're a spirit. Say, I'm a spirit. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. I want you to get this in your heart. You are a spirit. You don't have a spirit. You are a spirit. You are a spirit creation. In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, I want to begin reading. Taking your notes, you might want to put verse 14. I want to move up a little bit. I love this. Paul said, for the love of Christ constrains me. I like the Moffat's translation. For the love of Christ has overmastered me. Glory to God. He said, here's how I judge life. We judge this. If one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died and rose again. Wherefore know we no man after the flesh any longer. Even though we knew Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more in that way. Why? If any man be in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. How many people today have a picture of Jesus with long hair and sandals walking the seas of Galilee. Brothers and sisters, we know him no longer after the flesh. He is the first Adam, pray, the last Adam. He is the firstborn from out of death. He is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords and we don't know him as he walked then. And I want to tell you right now, the greatest person beside Jesus that you need to know after the Spirit is yourself. We know nobody after the flesh. That means you. The next time you're tempted to lust after somebody, just say to yourself, they're a new creation in Christ. 
They're a new creation in Christ. Treat them like one. Treat them with respect. Treat them with honor. Treat them. Treat yourself that way. The next time your body wants to do something wrong sexually, then just say, no, my body doesn't rule me. I am a new creation. You need not to know, first of all, you need to know Jesus after the Spirit. And secondly, you need to know yourself after the Spirit. And then know others after the Spirit. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Then second thing is you have a soul. What is that? Your mind, your will, your emotions. That's the part of you that reasons and thinks. Now, we have several verses written here, but I want to just go to Romans 12, 2. Okay? Now, in your lesson, there's several more. Romans 12, 2 says this, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Brothers and sisters, when you get your mind renewed, isn't it amazing you don't have near as many questions about the will of God? You see, you are a spirit. What do you do with your spirit? You feed your spirit and exercise it. What do you do with your mind? You renew it. You restore it. How? By the word of the Lord, by the presence of the spirit, taking on the thoughts of God. Then notice number C on your outline. You live in a body. Colossians 3, verse number 1 says this, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. King James says, Set your affections, phroneo is the word, it's your mind. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things of the earth, for your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then shall you appear with Him in glory. And the very next verse says this, and put to death the deeds of your body. That's how God works. Spirit, soul, body. Feed and exercise your spirit. Renew your mind. And you will be able to control your body. You understand that? That's how you walk in the spirit. So you need to understand that. Let me say this to you. And understand this, okay? Your spirit, you contact the spiritual realm. Conscience is the voice of your spirit. With your soul, you contact the mental realm. Reason is the voice of your soul. And with your body, you contact the physical realm. Feelings is the voice of your body. And if you want to be led by the Spirit, you've got to become more spirit conscious. Paul said, I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body. I've heard ministers say it this way. Body, soul, and spirit. When I first began to learn this, I thought, would that be true? And I started listening. I mean, good people, good preachers, good men. I'm talking about national television ministries. And I heard him say, Paul said, may your whole body, soul, and spirit be preserved. He did not. He said, your spirit, your soul, and your body, there's a purpose for that. That's the order of the kingdom. And if you say body, soul, and spirit, then you're more body conscious than you are spirit conscious. And think about it, most Christians are, because most most Christians are concerned with what they think and how they feel than what they believe. I mean, that's the truth. Now, come on. I'm talking about good people. They're more concerned about what they think, how they feel, than what they believe. But you, now here's what God said to me in our time of worship. Teach them how to walk in the Spirit. Understand this, if you want to walk in the Spirit and be led by the Spirit, you must get revelation of spirit, soul, and body. And if you do, your life will prosper. And we thank you that your word is true, Father, and forever settled in heaven. And I just thank you for revelation coming to the hearts of people in the precious name. Hey, I want to thank you for watching the Reach YouTube channel. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so you never miss a powerful message live stream for church update. You can find out so much more about what's happening here at the church by following us on Facebook and Instagram, as well as our website, reachchurch.us. While you're there, you can also help support the ministry and our vision of reaching and equipping people. Thanks for watching and God bless.